question for you this morning. If this was your last night on earth, who would you gather around you to spend it with? Think about that for a moment. And after you gathered that family or friends or whoever it is you want with you on that last night, what might be your last words of advice? Have you ever thought about that? Uh, you, Most of you know <coughs> that uh, I was an area minister, and of those 63 churches that I oversaw, one, one church in particular, a small church of about 75, uh, in a small community of about 4,000, was ruled by the patriarch of the church, not the pastors, the patriarch of the church, Dr. Jed. And uh, Dr. Jed was the community doctor. He was an actual physician. And so he was beloved in the community. He was beloved in the church. And pastor after pastor through the years could never do anything in the church unless Dr. Jed approved it. Dr. Jed always got the last word. And uh, the young pastor who was uh, I had helped place there and helped get the, a new position was so frustrated year after year he would call me and say, Dr. Jed always has to run the church. Dr. Jed always has to have the last word. And then finally, Dr. Jed died. And the young pastor called me up, and uh, this is probably not what pastors should be, but he was kind of joyful that Dr. Judd had passed on to his reward in heaven because he thought maybe now he would be able to actually uh, do some programming ideas or some of the things that he had wanted to do. And um, he got ready to do Dr. Judd's funeral. And it was a, just a giant affair because Dr. Judd was also a very prominent American Baptist. And so there were people from the community, people from the denomination, uh, the church was literally packed, and the young pastor had never preached to so many people. He was uh, so excited, except that he met me uh, outside before the service, and he said, you're not going to believe this. And I said, what? He said, Dr. Jed left a videotape, and he wants it played at the end of his service. And I said, well, <laughs> I said, that's your decision. <laughs> you have to decide. And the young pastor uh, played the video at the end of the service. And there was Dr. Jed, larger than life. He had videotaped himself or had someone do it. And he was right there on the screen giving all sorts of advice for his church, his community, his family, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And needless to say, it was one of the most unique services. Have you ever thought, what kind of advice, what would be your last words uh, to tell the people. You know, Jesus gathered basically for his last supper. It was his last time together. He gathered his 12 disciples. It would be the last time he'd see them before his uh, death and before his uh, arrest and his crucifixion. And he gathered the 12 disciples. It's interesting who he chose to uh, gather for his uh, final meal and for uh, the to celebrate the Passover meal. But it was the 12 men that he had walked with and talked with and, and taught for the last three years, and he gathered them together. Uh, they were gathered there in the upper room to celebrate the feast of the Passover. Now, you most of you will remember that historically, the Passover uh, was the festival that celebrated the final plague that was visited upon the Egyptians, so they would let the people go. The Israelites, the Hebrews, had been in captivity for 400 years. They had served and slaved and, and built buildings for the Pharaohs. And yet, uh, time and time again, when Moses asked the Pharaoh to let the people go, he refused. And plague after plague after plague was visited upon them until the final plague of the Passover. The Passover, uh, the people of Israel were given very strict instructions. If you look at the story uh, in Exodus chapter 14 or chapter 12, verse 14, the Lord God commands this. It says, This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting 
ordinance. They were to continually celebrate, and the Jewish nation has done that. For over 3,300 years, uh, the Jewish uh, people continue to celebrate Passover today. In Jesus' day and age, it was actually uh, expected of you, unless you had some good reason uh, not to, but you were expected to actually make a pilgrimage from wherever you lived to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. It was that important of an event. And so Jesus came with the disciples and uh, did that. Now, back to the Passover. Uh, during the actual institution of that Passover, the Israelites were given very specific instructions from God. Very specific. For instance, they were to have a one-year-old male lamb. Every single one of them. Every household had to get a one-year-old male lamb, and it had to be perfect without blemish, without defect, uh, no problems whatsoever. And they were to sacrifice that lamb that night at twilight, the exact time, all of them together. And if your household wasn't big enough to consume an entire lamb, you were to join with another household. Because after you sacrificed the lamb, you were to roast it with bitter herbs, and you were to eat that final meal. You were to be dressed and ready to go, and, and there was to be no yeast put in the bread for that meal because there wasn't time for it to rise. You were to have unleavened or bread without yeast because this was the final plague when the people would be freed and let go. The blood from the lamb was to be taken and placed on the lentil of the door brushed on the sides of the door and across the top so that when the Lord went through the country, the houses that were marked with the sacrificial blood would be passed over and the people inside would be safe. The other houses, the firstborn of every house, not just the people, but even the animals, their animals, the firstborn would die. And the scripture in Exodus says this, this was done so that all the gods of Egypt will know who is the one true God. Egypt had so many gods. They worshipped Ray, the sun god. They worshipped the Nile. They had so many. But even, even more devastating, Pharaoh himself thought he was a god. You know, that's one of the most fundamental sins of humanity as we like to think of ourselves as God. Well, Jesus and his disciples gathered to celebrate that Passover. And Jesus, at the end of the meal, began what we call the Lord's Supper. He instituted a new festival, a new event, a new meal. He took something very simple, a loaf of bread, and a cup of wine. Now, communion, as we celebrate it today, has many, many names in many traditions and uh, many churches. Some of you may have grown up Catholic or Lutheran or uh, some other tradition. Communion is known as the Lord's Supper, Eucharist, Mass, Holy Communion. It's called a sacrament. It's called an ordinance. We as Baptists tend to call it the Lord's Supper or just communion. We call it an ordinance. There are two ordinances in the church, in the Baptist church. One is communion. Do you know what the other one is? Baptism. Baptism and communion are the only two that we recognize as ordinances. But um, Baptists most often, as I say, call it an ordinance, which that comes from the Latin word, ordinaire, ordinaire, which simply means to set in order, to set in order. And I think that Jesus that night set in order, set in place, this very simple, beautiful act to help us remember. Over and over again, it says, remember me. Do this in remembrance of me. I want us to look, I wanted us to read all four of those verses, uh, all four of those scriptures that uh, dealt with the Lord's prayer, or the Lord's Supper, because I wanted us to see how they compared. What, what is the same in all of them? Uh, for instance, 
all of them talk about the fact that they gave thanks. Today, when we go to the table, we'll give thanks for the bread and the cup. Every single time they gave thanks. Think about what that means, that Jesus himself thought it was important to begin with thanks, to say a simple prayer of thanksgiving to God. The second thing they have in common is the bread, as the children recognized. Even the children recognized the bread represented the body of Christ. The third thing they had in common, all four scriptures that talk about the Lord's Supper, is that they had in common the cup. And even the children knew that it represented the blood of Christ. It also represented the new covenant, the new covenant that we have under Christ, that we're no longer under the law. And you might not think that's significant, except that in the Old Testament times, before Christ, there were so many laws that it was impossible to keep them. Sometimes we think that there's just the Ten Commandments. Even those are impossible to keep. Thou shalt not covet. How many of you have ever coveted? Thou shalt not lie, steal. Anyway, there were even more. There were laws for every single day of the year, laws on how to wash your food, what foods you could consume, laws on uncleanliness. It just went on and on and on. And in this simple institution, Jesus said none of those laws matter anymore. What matters is grace, that I love you so much that my grace covers all of those sins, covers all of those laws, covers all of the things that you do. I don't know about you, but I, I don't let a day go by without sinning. Think about that. None of us do. Whether it's sins of omission or commission. And I am so thankful that God forgives every one of us. Jesus Christ was the perfect sacrifice. Hebrews 7, 27 says, Unlike the other high priests, he, Jesus, does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. The Bible is very clear. God is very clear that the forgiveness of sin requires sacrifice, requires a blood sacrifice, that we are separated from God. You've heard this so many times that there's this giant separation that God is righteous and we are not and there's no way to get there. And Jesus Christ was the only one who could do it because he was without defect. He was without blemish. He was without sin. And his death on the cross, when he said, it is finished, that was a pivotal moment in all of history, in all of humanity. Because that moment, Christ took all of our sins, both past and present and all that we will ever commit. God took all of those sins and placed them on his son, Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And what did he ask that night when he gathered his disciples? What was his final words? His final words were very simple. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Remember me. Remember me. Now, I don't know if you've been thinking about who it is you'd like to have around you at the end or what kind of advice you'd want to give them. I could think of lots of advices. I, I, I really I think I might get that video idea going. I don't know. Just think how that would be, be able to tell your children exactly what they need to know after you're gone, or even your grandchildren, or, you know, just think of the people that you could leave messages for, right? Jesus could have done that. He could have said, uh, Peter, you're too impetuous. You're, you don't think before you speak. You put your foot in your mouth. You're, 
you're just too bold and, you, you know, you need to calm down. Uh, he could have said to John, John, you know, you're just too much of a mother's boy. You need to grow up a little bit. Matthew, you're just overly concerned with money. And, you know, the list, Thomas, you're such a doubter. I want you to, to, to have faith. He could have went down the row of those disciples. He knew them. He knew what their problems were, and he could have given them all sorts of advice. He could have given us advice, future advice for all the Christians to come. Wow, what a powerful moment. He could have said, I'm headed off to die on the cross for you, and here's what you need to do. And all he simply said was, remember me. Remember me. You know, we have hindsight. We know what he was talking about, the broken body and the blood. The disciples had no clue. What is he talking about? They had no idea that they were going to go out and he was going to be uh, arrested and crucified. And they had no idea what was coming. It wasn't until later that remember meant something to them. A simple loaf of bread to remember. A simple cup of wine. Martin Luther, who lived uh, during the uh, Reformation, who was the great reformer, the Lutheran reformer, uh, he has this to say about communion. And uh, it's a paraphrase from the German. It's a fascinating little preaching uh, from Luther. He says, now that we have a proper understanding of this sacrament, this, there is a great need for a strong admonition so that such a great treasure may not be heedlessly passed by. What I mean is that those who claim to be Christians should receive this blessed sacrament on a regular basis. You know, Jesus never told us how often to do this. And that's been one of the controversies throughout the 2,000 years. Do we do communion every time we meet? Do we do it once a quarter? Do we do it once a year? Uh, the variety is endless. Luther says, for we see that many are becoming listless and lazy about this observance. This is the 1500s. A lot of people who have now heard the gospel of God's free gift of forgiveness and who have been freed from the burden and the oppression of the law will now let a year or two or three or even more years pass without receiving the sacrament. As if they were such strong Christians that they have no need of it. Some believe that they should only go if they feel like going. Some think now that all they have to do is believe and then not do a single thing of any sort else. Is this all they have learned from the preaching of the gospel? That they can be so smart and confident that they can despise both the sacrament and the word of God? In all this, the devil, Martin says, Martin Luther, wins a great victory. The devil is always setting himself up against every Christian activity, hounding and driving people away from the true faith in every way he can. Here he even twists the gospel itself into a tool which he leads, he uses to lead people away from God. Do not let yourselves be deceived. Rather, he says, listen to God and obey the clear words of Christ. Do not this in remembrance of me. There should be no reason to compel anyone to come to this sacrament, and I will not do that. Actually, he's just done that for the last two or three paragraphs, right? He says, all should want to freely obey and please the Lord Jesus Christ. You may examine yourself in light of this commandment and say to yourself, if I am a Christian at all, I should have at least a little longing every once in a while to do what my Lord wants me to do. Think about those words. Those are so powerful. If I am a Christian at all, I should have at least a little longing every once in a while to do what my Lord wants me to do. The Lord commanded. This is one of the few commands to do this in remembrance of him. As a child in my home church, communion was a sacred, somber moment. It was a time where you had to sit absolutely quiet. 
There was no uh, fidgeting allowed. There was no moving allowed. There was absolute quiet. We couldn't draw on the pew envelopes. Are any of you doing that? Um, we, we had to be, we couldn't get up and go to the bathroom. You, you sat for communion. And at my church, it was a long communion service. There were 12 male deacons. They all had their black suits on. They all had dark ties. There were none of these flashy ties allowed during communion Sunday. They all, 12, came up and sat at the front of the, the service. And it just seemed like they were staring at you, just, you know, watching to see if you were going to move. Um, it was a long long time because they served everyone it was a huge church with uh four where we have two sections there were four sections filled with people and you sat and you sat and you sat and as a, a five six year old i can remember the worst part of it was was that it was closed communion and as as Jack, jackson said this morning you had to be a baptized member of that church and so year after year that plate would go right by me the little wafers and the little cups and I couldn't have any, and I was so just, what was this? But I knew it was important. We didn't miss communion Sunday. You might be sick, and you might miss some other Sunday, but you didn't miss communion Sunday, and you wore your finest clothes on communion Sunday, and you always, always sat quietly and listened on communion Sunday. Now, we've evolved a little bit. We have open communion nowadays, and we invite anyone who believes in Jesus Christ to partake of communion, anyone who knows him as their Savior and Lord. We, we don't worry about whether our deacons are all in black suits or not. But the things that haven't changed for 2,000 years is that we still have the bread that represents the body of Christ. We still have the cup that represents the blood and the new covenant. We still give thanks. We still have the forgiveness of sin. And we still have the reminder that Matthew and Mark both said, when Jesus said, I will not drink this again until I drink anew with you in my Father's kingdom. In other words, the foretelling of Jesus' return, that someday we will all gather together. Luther called it the communion of the saints. In October, the first, the first Sunday in October is World Communion Sunday, where thousands and millions of uh, Christians all across the world communicate and, and have world communion together. But that's just a drop in the, uh, drop in the bucket to the number that someday will unite with Jesus in the kingdom of God and celebrate anew and remember. Remember the past and what he's done. Remember right now what he's doing in our lives today. And remember that, yes, he is coming again. That was always an important element in the church I grew up in. It wasn't just about his death on the cross. It wasn't just about living for Jesus right now. But it was no, the knowledge of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the knowledge of his return. That yes, we truly believe that Jesus is coming again. I love that song. Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, but maybe soon. We don't know. But we continue to remember that that is the hope. That is the future of every single one of us. Whether it's today, tomorrow, or in another thousand years of celebrating communion. One day, one day we will celebrate in God's kingdom with Jesus himself. Oh, glorious day. We are going to sing. Our communion hymn. And we, if you just follow the screen, you'll be fine. But if you're looking at your hymnals, 
uh, you need to sing verse 3 first, 